Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone. Thanks to Basim for asking me to speak. Um, I, the, the, the title of this is Hints and Tips, so I don't make too many apologies if it's, if it's a little bit anecdotal and experience-led, as the name of the talk would, would tend to suggest. Um, and this, I think, really it sort of reflects previous life as a GP and now working as a sports and exercise medicine consultant and uh, the sort of type of knee pain that I see. So I'm aware that there's a lot of distinguished uh, people and faces in this audience and perhaps some more junior type people. So apologies if it's teaching people to suck eggs, um, but if it's not, then, then great. Um, so don't forget the basics when someone presents with anterior knee pain. Uh, think about uh, a really careful pain history in terms of what the type of pain is, what the alleviating, aggravating factors are. And we're going to hear from um, Claire shortly, and I remember Claire's lecture at a previous BASM, which is very much drill the history. It's absolutely crucial, so don't skip that part. Have a think also about what are the um, pain-sensitive structures that may become the pain generated in someone who presents with anterior knee pain, and, of course, associated symptoms. So mechanical-type symptoms, locking, swelling, giving way. Even in someone who perhaps presents with barn door patellofemoral pain, for the sake of a few seconds of asking, do they have any red flag symptoms, it's always worth doing that because one in a thousand times you may find that a patient has a sarcoma or something uh, a lot more nasty than patellofemoral pain. And again, I think Claire is going to allude to this in her talk, but understanding what the patient understands and what the patient knows about this is really critical. Um, I'm just going to skip on that, but this is just to reinforce the, the message about pain history. And just to touch upon chronic pain, so we, I think we tend to think of MSK as chronic pain as back pain, um, but there are certainly some people that may have a necessary investigations and management for anterior knee pain, and there may be no diagnosis as such, and these patients may well have a, a type of chronic pain syndrome. Um, and so we need to be able and be comfortable to explore the biopsychosocial model, which we often do in back pain. So all of those factors are important. And in my practice at Pure Sports Medicine, I also work at Bupa Reading, um, and perhaps more at Bupa Reading, I see a lot more chronic knee pain where people have often had uh, various surgeries in the past, and it's important, of course, to get previous notes and details about exactly what they've had done. Is a diagnosis important? I feel very passionately about this, that musculoskeletal and sports and exercise medicine is no different from any other branch of medicine, in my opinion. It's no different from cardiology, gynecology, respiratory medicine, whatever um, speciality it may be. We try and get the diagnosis early on, and at that stage, you can then look at what the evidence base is for the various treatment options available. And I think sometimes in MSK, we don't really do that, and sometimes patients are hang around care a little bit long. This is not to label people, but just to try and get an accurate diagnosis. So we want to avoid this sort of scenario. We're going to hear from James about ultrasound and investigations. Um, I won't go into this in detail. Now, again, two very simple thoughts every time I see a patient with knee pain is, does this investigation change my management? And that sounds really simple, but I hope that everybody thinks that, because there's no point doing something if it doesn't change your management. And could it do more harm than good? There are various uh, studies that show uh, the incidence of meniscal tears in a pain-free population. So if you are doing MRI scans in people um, over a certain age, um, I would say middle age and above and at 45, I'm almost certainly in that category, you will find some meniscal pathology. Is that relevant and could in some circumstances, could that lead to unnecessary surgery? There are various causes. So what do we mean by anterior knee pain? And it's all about the nomenclature. And I've just listed a few of these, uh, and I'm sure this it doesn't cover everything. And I'm just going to touch upon the four that I've listed in bold <coughs> today. Patellofemoral pain, patella tendinopathy, and osteoarthritis of the patellofemoral joint may present with similar type of symptoms or each of those conditions, in my experience, may present very classically and individually with that subgroup of symptoms. But there is often a crossover, and that's often where we need to think about 
management investigations and what may help us in that scenario. And of course, these diagrams would represent that some people may have some elements of all three pathologies, and we mustn't always think it's just one and not others in association with that. So Claire's going to talk about patellofemoral pain. When I assess someone with patellofemoral pain, I like to think of it as a structural test, so is there an effusion, the range of movement, ligament, and meniscal tests, which usually in someone with patellofemoral pain are going to be normal. Functional tests, so physios will be all over this. I think as doctors, you should have this in your armory to be able to um, get a patient to do a deep squat, a single leg squat, a lunge, perhaps isometric glute medius testing. So if you pick up on these things, that really gives you some good stuff around your letter when you're sending them off to physiotherapy or other rehab colleagues. And biomechanical tests, so particularly with patellofemoral pain, are the pronated feet is the tibial varum, Q angle, patella position, and all these aspects. So if I suspect patellofemoral pain from the history and the examination, <clears throat> what I explain to the patient is that this is a functional knee problem, not a structural knee problem. Now, I don't mean that completely exclusively, but that's how I get the patient on board with the idea of patellofemoral pain and how we're going to manage it, which is usually robust rehabilitation and commitment on the, on the gym floor. So ultrasound scan, I will sometimes use in a patient that presents with patellofemoral pain, but may have some localized patella tendon pain. And the rationale for that is, yes, it does change my management, because if I do an ultrasound scan in clinic and the patella tendon looks completely normal, that will take them down a different rehab program than someone with patella tendinopathy. And of course, eccentric uh, loading uh, will often aggravate the patellofemoral joint and cause further issues. MRI, certainly in private practice, patients often come and want an MRI from day one. That's okay if you talk it through with the patient and you warn them about incidental findings um, as analogous really to back pain. But I usually do it about six to eight weeks if people are really not responding at all to rehabilitation or physio. Patient needs to know it takes a lot of time. And it's a multifactorial problem which needs a multidisciplinary approach. So use your physio, use a podiatrist, strength and conditioning, other things that you may have available, whichever setup you're in. So if you put the ultrasound probe on, and James is going to do this, but you see a normal patella tendon, that's a very useful thing you can do in the clinic with your ultrasound. And then, as I said, eccentric squats is a very different rehab program for someone who has patellofemoral pain. So a little bit of a paper, so it's not all anecdotal. This is a consensus statement that came out from Crosley and colleagues this year. And I often bring the slide up and show it to patients because I think it fits with their symptoms. So it's patellofemoral pain is the preferred term, which covers the syndrome, chondromalacia, anterior knee pain, and runner's knee, which, of course, is a dreadful term that we should never use. It's pain around or behind the patella, which is aggravated by loading the patellofemoral joint. And often patients in the history will say this is squatting, doesn't have to be in the gym. I had a patient yesterday who was picking his young baby up from the floor and squatting and that aggravated his knee. It may be gym-based or other sporty activity. An additional criteria which are not essential but we often see crepitus grinding, sometimes a small effusion is present, and pain sitting, straightening the knee, these sorts of factors. And I'm sure people would know there's no specific definitive clinical test. This is a history-based uh, diagnosis. There are a proportion of people that may present with fat pad problems or Hoffer's disease. Fat pad is known to have a very rich nerve supply. And this condition can develop insidiously or it can uh, result from a blow to the knee. And this is about patella positioning in part, which leads to fat pad irritation. So these patients usually have localized pain and it may coexist with patella tendinopathy as well. You may find that uh, walking or prolonged standing, which will give you a slight difference in history to those with sitting who may have patellofemoral pain. And you may find various things including a bulky or puffy tendon with a positive Hoffer's test when extending the knee. I discussed this with James at Bournemouth recently. Theoretically, you can see hyperechoic fat 
uh, on the diagnostic ultrasound in, uh, I don't think James is convinced and he doesn't look overly convinced now, but uh, theoretically you may see this on an ultrasound in skilled hands. And James, is very, James is very skilled hands. Uh, on an MRI scan, you'll see, on some of the sequences, you'll see something like this with increased signal, okay? And often, if you don't see the MRI, but you get the report of the MRI, it will say something like there is edema in the supralateral aspect of Hoffer's fat pad, and the radiologist will report that. Um, the rehab and physio approach is often the same, but for those c cases that are really difficult and don't settle, sometimes an injection of some cortisone uh, will help, and uh, I'm not sure Sam, our surgeon, is mentioning this, but sometimes fat pad surgery does occur uh, in people that have explored other options. Osteoarthritis, I see a lot of, particularly um, in the sort of more chronic cases I see in buprenorphine, and of course this may be one, two, or three compartments of the knee affected, but with anterior knee pain, we're usually thinking about patellofemoral joints. This may present with other conditions, as we said, but the history really here is often that of impact pain, payback pain, the following morning or that night, and swelling. And previously in MED, I would see a huge amount of this in young Marines who would do significant amounts of uh, phys, as we would call it, or loaded physical activity. My experience with this is it's often poorly dealt with, and the patient has no idea what their diagnosis is and they may have radiological evidence of osteoarthritis and never been advised that. And there is some evidence for hyaluronic acid injections, Ostinil, Ostinil Plus, in isolated patellofemoral joint osteoarthritis, and I have used that uh, with some modest success. Arthritis Research UK is a reference just to show again and remind ourselves of the risk factors of osteoarthritis and the top one there, obesity, and again, I think this is done very poorly, is the patient with osteoarthritis of any part of the knee um, that's overweight. I often find no documented history at all of that discussion with the patient that they should lose weight, and that is often an effective intervention for osteoarthritis and knee pain, whether it's um, feeling uncomfortable having that sort of discussion, but it's really important. So... The other thing I just want to mention about osteoarthritis is the various terms that people will have. So people will be told it's wear and tear or degeneration. And, and often on an MRI report, you'll see things such as chondral thinning, osteophytic change, joint space narrowing. And of course, you may have bone stress that's seen on some types of MRI imaging. And this can progress over time to valgus or varus deformities of the knee. The way I manage this is, this is probably the most difficult condition because if you have a sporty, active patient who likes running and you diagnose them with osteoarthritis, that is often a very difficult discussion. We talk about pain relief, we talk about physio and rehab to strengthen the knee and gluteals and to reduce the loading through the knee, weight loss as mentioned, and injections, be it cortisone or perhaps hyaluronic acid or sometimes a combination of both. And of course, surgery, and uh, that's really not my realm, but this may vary from unicompartmental, but in my experience, people more have a widespread OA, and it tends to be a total knee replacement. And that may be appropriate for younger patients. I don't think people have to slave to each of those steps. And of course, what is important is you put those options on the table for your patient and explore what is right for them. This is just a Cochrane review. <clears throat> excuse me, which just shows that exercise is as effective as non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in knee osteoarthritis. So think about the type of exercise your patients can do. Uh, steer them perhaps away from running and get them on a bike or get them swimming um, for the longevity of their knee. Uh, and that may well avoid the need to put them on naproxen or NSAIDs and some of the side effects that may come from that. So my anecdotal experience in summary of OA, just to recap, is often poorly dealt with. Various terms are used, but just explain to the patient, give it to them simply and let them understand what it means. Weight loss is often not discussed, and many patients are not aware of their diagnosis. 
the discussion I have is about long-term management. We're not going to fix or cure your osteoarthritis, but we are hoping to manage it. And that really allows the patient to get on board with the idea that they're never going to get to, a, or unlikely, to get to a point where they're fixed, but they can manage it successfully. And of course, not all options are suitable for patients. Some patients may never want to take painkillers and want to progress to a more definitive option. And the balance, I find, is when people say, when should I have a knee replacement performed? And I often say, it's about your quality of life, about your function, and whether you've explored all the options that we've put in front of you. And if at that time they, they want to, then of course refer them to a knee surgeon and let them have a further, more detailed, informed discussion. I'm just going to finish with a case history. I think we're okay for time, Richard. 58-year-old um, female presented to uh, my clinic complaining of pain and swelling in the anteromedial aspect of her knee. The pain had been there for 12 months with moderate swelling, no trauma, no locking, giving way, and she'd started running a few weeks prior to it presenting. Her BMI was 31, so she was running to get fit and lose some weight. She saw a physio, then a surgeon uh, nine months ago, so three months after the presentation, was told that the scan showed a warm bit of meniscus. And as she was no better with two sessions of physiotherapy, the surgeon operated. The patient was told that the knee was tidied up. Pain was no better, and after three or four months of ongoing significant pain, she had a second MRI organized by the surgeon who said there was nothing new to be worried about and suggested more physio. She tried to continue running, but it progressed and became more severe. She was then referred to me by Bupa for another opinion. Examination findings as there, as, as on the slide, and the patient had no details. This is all from her history. I had nothing to go on. So I sent her away and said, you need to contact the private clinic and the surgeon secretary and bring the letters back so we've got something to go on here. The first MRI report, and I didn't see the images. We didn't have the discs. It showed a degenerate medial meniscus with a moderate knee effusion and moderate to severe chondral loss in both the patellofemoral and medial compartments. So to me, that said more than a warm bit of meniscus. The second scan after the surgery showed that the appearance of the meniscus is consistent with previous surgery, as one would expect, and the chondral loss remains the same with an enlargement of the Baker's cyst and an ongoing effusion in the knee. So just thinking about that case, in my opinion, this is only opinion, two sessions of physiotherapy are not enough unless you know that physiotherapist to be the best physiotherapist in the world, and they turn around and say to you, I've done everything I can with this patient. There's nothing more I can do. That may happen after two sessions, but I think it's unlikely. Nobody used the term osteoarthritis or explained to the patient what was going on in the knee. And again, this is not a label, but give the patient the accurate diagnosis. A degenerate meniscus, and there's been a little bit of Twitter stuff on this recently about people having surgery. I view, and I think most of my colleagues we view as part of an osteoarthritis spectrum. And I remember listening to a talk from Leon Creaney here a couple, uh, a couple years ago at, at St. George's with the amount of meniscus being removed being directly proportional to the risk of osteoarthritis in later life. The patient had not been advised about weight, so we had to do a regain with this patient's thoughts and understandings and talked about management rather than cure. And my last plea, really, is wherever you work, be it privately, NHS, MOD, if you have the formal MRI report, give it to your patient. Because often these patients travel around healthcare pathways. And although I might look at an MRI scan, a surgeon might look at an MRI scan, a physio might, you have a radiologist report then, unless you're going to actually write your own full radiology report, and override the radiologist, give them the gold standard at that stage, because that makes a huge difference. Of course, there may be terms on there that might scare the patient, so read it through and make sure they understand it. But give it to them, give them the CD, and that makes their journey through health care a lot easier. Thank you.